And my name is uh, Eva Hendiblom. I'm from Sweden and I started on this path of research at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I would work with teens for a couple of decades, um, mostly teens with anxiety and depressive problems. Uh, I used to run a yoga studio in Stockholm also, so I had the opportunity to teach yoga and mindfulness to the community and to schools. So I've seen about what that can do to young people, which has been inspiring me in creating this intervention that I would talk with you about tonight. And um, I want to thank the, the Osher Center who are making this whole thing possible, uh, both having a lecture like this, but also the research that we're doing here. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you also to, to save questions. Even though we are um, a small group, I think it'll be easier to save questions towards the end so that I can continue to speak, and then we can uh, have questions and answers towards the end. And I'll, be, I'll keep going for about one and a half hours. Um, and I wanted to outline uh, this lecture like this. I wanted to talk to give you some reality check about what the prevalence of uh, em emotional dysregulation in terms of anxiety and depression looks like uh, in the United States and um, also tell you a little bit about how we as child psychiatry diagnose people, uh, how that works and what we offer as treatments currently. Uh, also give you an overview about the cutting edge science about what biology shows in terms of depression and anxiety and how that can inform us about new treatment targets. And um, I want to spend some time with, this is an important part <laughs> for me, about contextualizing uh, anxiety and depression uh, as opposed to having it as a medicalized disorder type of thing. And then presenting the TARA model, which we are currently researching here at UCSF, um, and tell you a little bit about the studies that are coming up does this seem relevant? <laughs> Good. Uh, so we have a predicament. The prevalence of anxiety for teens, anxiety and depression for teenagers is increasing, and that's the case in the United States, and it's the case in the whole Western world, in Sweden, in Europe also. And um, the problem is that if you're getting depressed early on in life, there is a high risk for recurrent episodes. So you kind of establish a pattern of um, recurrent uh, depressive episodes and it's hard, harder to treat the more episodes that you've had. Um, and also, if you get depression as a teenager or younger, there are man many negative health outcomes that are linked to depression. There are increased risk for cardiovascular disease, there are increased risk for dementia and cognitive problems, and also, um, of course, suicidality and self-treatment um, strategies like substance abuse, for instance. And the big problem is that we don't really have a cure within the medical paradigm. We offer SSRIs, antidepressant medications, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to young people en masse. And uh, we offer also some um, psychological treatments and none of those show very much effect if you follow up long term. So th this is where we're at today. Uh, and the prevalence is alarming. This is um, almost a 50... If, if you would uh, look into American youth uh, and look at their symptomatology and match it up with our diagnos diagnostic manuals, like I don't know if you're familiar with the DSM-4 or the DSM-5, about 50% would end up with a, a mental health disorder diagnosed. And about 42% of those kids um, have severe disorders. And out of the 50% or 49.5, about 43 uh, have depressive problems and about 30% have anxiety disorders. So this is a huge, this is a, um, a mental health problem of, of very big dignity. And it costs society, personal suffering, enormous amounts. And um, interestingly, 
it's, the prevalence is pretty low for children. There are children being depressed also, but something happens around puberty. So you can see here how, how the prevalence goes up and um, hitting around 16, 17. That's where we, within child psychiatry, see most patients showing up. Hi, welcome. And also you see the ratio that it's more common in puberty in girls as compared to boys. And we are not really sure whether that is actually the case or whether it's the case that boys and girls have different symptomatology and the way that girls often show symptoms are more introverted and that is more aligned with our diagnostic criteria. And boys have more externalized um, problem behavior, not all of them, but many. So maybe that um, gender distribution is not really true. And uh, some people say that, oh, is it really true that anxiety and depression is in, uh, in on, in, on an increase, or is it more that it's more culturally acceptable to say that you have anxiety and depression? So these are um, graphs from Sweden, and I'm sure they look pretty much the same in the United States. And what you can see uh, are actual inpatients, like hospitalized kids with depressive disorder. So the, the red dot here is um, major depressive disorder, and the blue one is anxiety disorders. And for females, you can see how, how much it increases, uh, as opposed to psychotic disorders, which remain stable. And also, in, in males, it's much more stable. So it's especially a vulnerable population, young teenage women. Um, And also, uh, the prevalence of suicide attempts show a similar pattern where the red dot show young females, 16 to 24 years old, that increase males pretty stable, and uh, older um, parts of the population pretty stable also. So it's something happening here. And as I said before, those gender differences may be because we are not very good at recognizing recognizing uh, boys with depression. When it comes to completed suicide, the picture looks different because it's actually the, the teenage boys, 16 to 18, who have the highest rate of complete suicide. And they're often using more violent uh, ways to, kill, to try to kill themselves. Um, so I think this is uh, something important to remember for us clinicians. This is a slide that I wished I didn't have to show you, but I want to show it anyway because I think it's so alarming. Suicide was the second leading cause of death among children aged 12 to 17 years in the United States, 2010. And there are similar numbers in Sweden, and it's not right. It shouldn't be this way, and we have to do something, all of us. So this was a little bit about the reality check, where what it actually looked like in terms of numbers. And I wanted to give you a doorway into psychiatry for you to know how we as doctors, how we behave and what we believe in and what we do from that paradigm uh, to help these kids for good and for bad. And I'll, I'll try to, to um, explain it as good as I can. Um, depression diagnoses are based on symptom criteria, and this is really important. So it's not that um, if you have a cardiac uh, arrest, you have a cardiac arrest, and that is like black or white or uh, apple or pear. It's like um, e evident. But with, with this, it's like long lists of symptom criteria. This is what it looks like in, in our big books of of diagnostic manuals, and you, you basically interview the patient and you, you check off. And when you hit um, a certain amount of criteria, you say that you have major depressive disorder. And this is not really what reality looks like because it's more like this. You know, as, as, as a child, you may be free from depression, and then around puberty, you have some stressful events, you get depressed, and then you hit the cutoff and you get diagnosed with depression. And then you get some treatment and you feel better and you go into some remission that may be full remission or partial remission. And then something hits again in your life and you get into a new episode. So all of this is more or less depression. But it's up to us to kind of diagnose it in terms of those diagnostic criteria. And um, there are some problems with this because 
as I said, it's not like having a sore throat that either you have it or you don't. It can be also that it's contextual, that it depends on what situation you're in, how many stress factors are currently in your life, how much trauma have you experienced, um, that make this profile slide. Um, so it can be more of a dimensional construct than a categorical, categorical construct. And some people think, some research shows, that depression can be both and. So there is kind of a normal distribution of vulnerability for depression, and within that, the context matters. And then there are some people who get more severe type of depression, like melancholic depression, that seems to be more of something that you either have or you don't have. So this is pretty complex, and nobody really knows. But it has implications for treatment, of course, how, how we look upon depressive disorder. And um, the problem also is that our manuals, they are adapted for men, middle-aged men. <laughs> and when you talk about teenagers, especially teenage girls, they behave very differently when they are depressed. So, for instance, adults, they usually have weight loss, they have decreased appetite, they wake up early in the morning with anxiety, they have um, loss of um, facial expression, they are, have mot motor retardations, they move slowly. And if you've ever met a depressed teenager, y you know immediately that's not usually the way teens behave when they are depressed. They have often a lot of anxiety, difficulties to get to sleep, and then you can't get them out of bed in the morning. They want to sleep all day. Um, and they have impulsive behavior. They are often still some so or still out with friends and social, and instead of being very sad, they're often extremely irritable and moody and reactive. So it's a completely diff different um, uh, picture. And, and this impulsive behavior also plays out in, in different ways, like maybe drinking too much, cutting oneself to um, decrease anxiety, uh, binge eating and vomiting, all kinds of behaviors that are very comorbid with depressive disorder in teens. Um, and I would say the biggest difference with teenage boys and girls is that the boys have the more externalized behavior. So they're, they, they're more often not coming to child psychiatry. They are more often behaving out there in society and, and getting other types of help. And, and the suicide picture is, is different. So there's more young girls trying to commit suicide, but they use less violent techniques and are less often successful than, than boys. Um, and um, this is just a summary of our diagnostic challenges. They are totally unprecise, <laughs> as you can gather from what I've told you. It's, it's uh, a changing sym symptomatology across the lifespan, different symptomatology between genders, and our diagnostic manuals doesn't mirror this at all. And the boundaries are very unclear, and we also have in teenagers high comorbidity, so it's very rare to find a teenager with only major depressive disorder. Most of them have uh, insomnia or anxiety or some kind of abuse, drug abuse, or something more, eating disorders. It's a very often complex picture. And to move on to what we within the medical world try to do about this. Uh, we have two major strategies, and one is antidepressive medication. Uh, it's often called SSRIs, the select, Selective Serotonin Reuptake inhi Inhibitors, uh, antidepressive medication. And the other one is cognitive, cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBT. And unfortunately, as I said before, none of these are have been so far successful in altering this epidemic that, that we're experiencing. And of course, as a doctor, it's tempting to have the magic pill to fix someone, to have a depressed teenager coming in and you have this pill and say, you'll, you know, it's, it's, all well, it's all up from here, you'll be fine. And, and this is something, of course, that insurance companies also think is, is very attractive. And the reality for the teen looks often very different. And um, unfortunately, we, we have seen also that um, SSRIs, if you, if you 
prescribe them and someone starts uh, taking them and then stops and starts again and stops and starts again, the e effect is getting reduced. Um, so there is a habituation of the effect. And actually there is no evidence whatsoever that SSRIs are better than placebo in mild to moderate teenage depression. depression. There are huge uh, meta-analyses done, ex for example, uh, by the Cochrane Institute um, that doesn't, doesn't show an effect at all. And still 14% of teenagers with mood disorders are on this type of medication. And we know that they don't only affect one little part of the brain, they affect the whole brain. There are certain ergic receptors in the whole brain. Um, and we don't know much about the long-term side effects of these uh, substances. Uh, what we do know is short-term side effects. Um, and uh, one is sexual dysfunction, which can be very problematic, of course, for a teenager. Uh, there can be other things like um, vertigo or stomach pains. Uh, also, interestingly, increased suicidal ideation in teenagers. And I'd speak a little bit more about that in a while. So we have this drug versus placebo effect, and I'll explain this um, to you. If if this is a depression improvement over here, and this is um, the initial severity of depression, you can see that if you have a mild type of depression, placebo is actually more effective than antidepressant medication, right? And then if you move across the axis here over to really, really severe depression, you actually do have some effect. The green area here is the clinical significant difference and this is a picture that applies for adults. I'm not so sure it even applies for teens. So I said that um, actually suicidal ideation is increasing when you give SSRIs to uh, adolescents. And uh, the Federal Drug Administration realized that and came out with a warning 2004 uh, saying that maybe clinicians should be a little bit more careful in prescribing these drugs for young people. And that resulted in a decrease um, in prescription of these drugs, except for the very elderly who didn't show the same pattern. So you would think that was all well then. <laughs> but um, some people were arguing that, okay, maybe if now SSRIs are decreasing, we'll see an increasing suicide rate. And that was seen in the beginning in some populations. But when you follow these um, graphs for a longer period of time, you see that it's completely unrelated. So in Sweden, for instance, the case is that suicide increases at the same time as the amount of prescribed SSRIs increase in the same population. So it doesn't seem to be related. And what also is really interesting is that Around this time point, 2003-2004, what happened with our depressed <laughs> teens? They diminished in number, and that would be kind of counterintuitive. Uh, but from a clinician's point of view, you still want to prescribe these drugs, right? Now I'm, now I'm speculating. I don't have research to uh, support what I'm saying, but I, many people would agree with me. At least I want to share this information, and you can draw your own conclusions. What happens was that the diagnostic trend was um, saying that um, the observed rate of major depressive disorder in this age group is decreasing from that time point that the FDA came out with the, the drug warning, right? And this is what we see instead. Antipsychotic drugs are being prescribed much more frequently than before. This is a tremendous increase, um, a sevenfold increase since um, the mid-90s. And if you, for instance, have a bipolar disorder, you can be prescribed these drugs. And we have also seen a huge increase of the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in young people. And some people are also describing antipsychotic drugs for um, ordinary major depressive disorder. And this, is a, this, are, this type of drugs have much more severe side effects than SSRIs. They have effect on metabolism. They have effect on uh, cognitive function. And um, many teens who are on these drugs are very um, 
suffering from, from side effects. This is what we see, and we can't draw any conclusions from this, but this, this is the reality. And linked to this, I would also want to mention that we have a tendency in our society to, to prescribing more and more drugs and consuming more and more drugs. So this is what it looks like for stimulants. There's been a seven-fold increase from 5 million to 35 million in a couple of years. It's huge amounts of amphetamine being prescribed to kids especially, especially in the United States. It's not as much in Europe, but it's, the trend is the same there. And interestingly for uh, opiates, that's sedatives, it's for anxiety uh, sleeping pills, show the same pattern. It's increasing, and it's a huge increase. <laughs> and this shows, this is not, well, it is kind of related to depression because it shows this general way we, in the medical world, treat um, mental disorders. Uh, the prevalence of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is uh, in some parts of the country uh, over 11 percent. One one kid in 10 have that diagnosis. And in the same areas, almost 10% of all kids eat amphetamine, central stimulantia, that have also long-term side effects that we don't fully know. What we do know is that kids who are on these drugs, they don't show any better prognosis that kids with the same diagnosis do without the drugs long-term as adults. I think this is important to know. It's important to know, and this is driven by, of course, by industry. There is a huge interest in having people eating these drugs. And I'm asking myself as a clinician, when I tell a young kid that you have a mental disorder, something is wrong with your brain, you need uh, medication, maybe lifelong, what am I doing to that kid? Am I empowering that person? Uh, or am I making the situation worse in many ways. Is, is it really needed? And with this, I want to say also that I have prescribed a lot of antidepressive drugs and even antipsychotic drugs as a child psychiatrist. And some, some, some people, I would say, within the severe spectrum benefit from it. So I'm not opposed at all to medication. It's just that it's such a huge increase. And I think we need to be very self-critical um, about how, how this is happening and why. I was talking about cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, that's the most evidence-based of psychological treatment that there is uh, for adults with depression and anxiety and also for teens. And the idea behind cognitive behavioral therapy is that you can basically talk to yourself. So if you feel anxiety or depression, you can kind of realize that and say to you, you can kind of reality check your thoughts and get help with that. So, so that you can self-regulate from top down. So you use this red area, your prefrontal cortex, to regulate your emotional brain, the amygdala, for instance, in the limbic brain, to calm down. And this sounds like a really nice way to, to handle things, right? And it's possible to do it, especially for adults, especially if you have not very severe uh, problems. But for teens, it's more problematic, and I'll tell you why. This is what the prefrontal region look like. And this is a five-year-old brain, a pre-teen brain, teen brain, and this is a person in their 20s. These are made from many, many scans. So um, it's just to show you the developing. There is a process called pruning of neurons in the brain that happens throughout development. And uh, it basically changes the connection between neurons in the brain. So You've probably heard that what, what wires, that fires. What fires, that wires. So that your connectome uh, in the brain actually can change over time depending on your behavior and what you do. And by normal development, this is happening. So um, the red part is less fully mature and the blue is fully mature. And green is somewhere in between. And it's not until mid-20s that your prefrontal cortex is fully developed. And that means that the cognitive top-down control is super difficult for a teenager, especially if you have anxiety or have emotion dysregulation. 
it sounds really good, but in reality, it's not a very effective treatment. And I've seen a lot of depressed teens. And they can do it, but when, when they really need it, it's not really the right way to go from, from, my, own, from my own clinical <laughs> view. So uh, we don't have very potent, potent ways to manage this and help these kids, unfortunately, in, in our medical psychiatric world. And I want to share with you uh, a little bit about what biology tells us, um, what mechanisms are involved in depression, and how can that inform us about new ways to help our future generations to come, to live healthy lives. What we can conclude and what um, science is, is um, telling us is that it's not primar primarily about um, lack of antidepressant medication or not even lack of serotonin. Serotonin may be involved, but it's not the primary drive to create depressive disorder. There are other hypotheses like sustained threat may have something to do with it, sustained stress and sustained threat. Um, which often leads to disturbed sleep, which is definitely involved. We have increased systemic inflammation. Uh, we have decrease of our capacity to regulate our body. And I'll talk a little bit about what kind of neuroimaging findings um, we have and how trauma and limbic scarring plays a part in the development of depression. Um, so, um, how much stress we perceive depends on our amygdala. Uh, one person, two persons can be in the same situation and have very different stress levels depending on how they have been wired since childhood. You perceive, we all perceive stress differently. And uh, the amygdala and the hippocampus in the limbic brain are the structures that is involved in uh, being a gateway for sensory perception and tell us how, how to interpret that and how to react to it. So if we have this stress going on, we will have a sympathetic arousal and we will have a lot of adrenaline, for instance, pumping out in our system. We will also have our adrenal glands producing cortisol and the sympathetic stress response cre creates increased inflammation. And both, both inflammation and sustained levels of heightened cortisol levels are not very good for the brain long term. It's very efficient for acute stress, but if you have this, especially during the development, it's not healthy. So, um, yeah, also oxidative stress, both oxidative stress and inflammation, those are neurotoxic uh, processes. So, we can measure pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood. And I've done that in my own research, comparing depressed teens with healthy controls. And the ones who have depression, they have increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And um, the cytokines, they impact neurocircuitry in the brain that are implicated for our behavior and our mood. Uh, and probably having these circumstances for long duration of time increases the risk to react with anxiety and depression. And also, if, if you, you've probably all experienced this, at least I have, if I have increased levels of stress for a sustained period of time, my sleep is getting disturbed, and I have often difficulties to fall asleep because I process what I've been through during the day. And um, this is the case for a lot of teenagers also, that they have these increased stress levels and they can't downregulate when it's time to sleep. So they are awake and awake and awake and then they finally fall asleep around in the morning somewhere and then it's impossible for them to get back and, and get to school. And we know that sleep is not very good for emotion regulation. We all know what it's like having been awake for a night. We are more irritable. It's harder to focus. Uh, all this applies, of course, for teen as well. Memory, the consolidation of memory is affected also. So not only attention, but actually the consolidation of memory. So they have much worse, they're much worse off when it comes to school and manage school work. It's associated with poor depression treatment response, increased risk of suicide. 
Um, so kids who are, who are depressed, um, if they get sleep deprived, the risk of suicide increases. And I'll talk about autonomic regulation. That is something that I've been really interested in my own research. And uh, we've seen that autonomic regulation is disturbed. It's um, not functioning as well in depressed teenagers. And autonomic regulation is actually related to the stress response. So it's about my heart rate. It's about my finger temperature. It's about my... Um, the whole, my whole system is engaged in the stress response. And it's good to have this stress response, but it's toxic to have it always. And if, if we have this situation for a long time, our ability to find regulate is decreased. So um, we have, we'll, be more, we'll have a more rigid aut autonomic nervous system. And we have this situation, so from the prefrontal cortex all the way through the amygdala and down through the limbic brain and through the brain stem, all the way for example, to our heart, this autonomic regulatory pathways go. And we can actually measure, uh, by measuring the uh, ECG, the electrocardiogram, a normal um, you know, registration of the heartbeat, we can measure the variability of the heart rate. And if we have a low variability, that shows that we have this rigidity of our autonomic nervous system. And that is related to depression already in teenagers. So we want, we want to have, it's called like a, a vagal break. We want to have a good vagal break. We want to have our nervous system and our heart not working as a pacemaker in an even beat. We want our heart to beat faster every time we breathe in and slower every time we breathe out. That's a healthy heart. And we can measure this. It's called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And... Uh, uh, this is what the variability can look like, and we can do um, statistical transformation of this data so that we can see how the variability behaves in different fre frequency bands. And what we want to see is the huge variability in the high-frequency domain where we have our breathing within that frequency. And this is just an example. This is not statistical valid or anything. This is just an example from a study I did in Sweden where we measured 100 depressed teenagers and 100 normal controls to compare the heart rate variability. This is just an example about what the variability looks like in a healthy person. And you see the red peak is high there for respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And this is what it looks like, like in a depressed person. Um, flat and almost an invisible red peak. And the good, the good thing about this, and I'll talk about this towards the end here, is that we can do something about it. This is not written in stone in any way. Our brain is plastic and our nervous system is also plastic, so by um, the right type of training, we can do something about this. And respiration is key here. Mm, I will move on to talk a little bit about the neuroscience of adolescent depression which is high re relevant also. Uh, now when I'm here at UCSF, I'm at a neuroscience lab with Professor Young, and he has been doing neuroimaging on 100, more than, I think it's 140 kids now that have depressive disorders, and uh, comparing what kind of neurocircuitry is involved and how does it differ from normal controls. And this is fMRI, which is, stand for functional magnetic resonance, resonance imaging. And the functional is important here because we don't measure structure in these kinds of studies. We measure blood flow. So we put the person in a scanner and then they do a, speci a specific task in the scanner. So it can, for example, be to be exposed to emotional faces. And then uh, we can see how the blood flows in the brain when they process these images and how the blood flows differently in the depressed versus the healthy controls. And the blood flow is a proxy of where the neural activity is in the brain, of course. So what, what is the most robust finding? This is both in um, adults and teenagers. We see a hyperactivation of the amygdala and the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex. 
Um, the amygdala is part of this limbic emotional brain, and uh, the singlet cortex is connected uh, functionally to the amygdala. And we have this, I have to show the next slide because this is so cool. <laughs> This is the insular cortex that I'm going to talk about. And it's a part of the brain that is actually hidden inside of the brain. So you know the cortex is folded, and um, it's folded deeply in here. So the insular cortex is hiding in here. And this is a super interesting part of the brain where probably our self-awareness is located. And it's also the integrative hub from where we interpret body signals from bottom up to conscious awareness. So it's like our, our awareness of emotions is situated in, in the insular cortex. And when we do this uh, fMRI studies, we can see that there is a decreased differential activation in the anterior insular cortex, uh, which means that if the kids are exposed to anger faces or sad faces or fearful faces, the depressed ones don't differentiate. They react pretty much the same way. Um, healthy kids react differently depending on what stimuli they are exposed to. And we also see that the functional connectivity, that is how the blood flow is streaming within the insular cortex and then in other connected areas, we can see that that is altered in the depressed teens in relation to other key areas for emotional processing. And we also see that the kids have um, abnormal activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. So our brain has two halves, and on the inside of those halves, that's the medial prefrontal cortex in the front part of the brain. And that's where we ruminate. That's where we worry. That's where we have our so-called self-referential processing. Oh, maybe they don't like what I'm talking about. Oh, maybe I'll be stressed out tomorrow. Or maybe I forgot to do that all that kind of self-referential self-talk that depressed people have a lot of, that is located in that part of the brain. And we can see that that's an area that activates more in depressed teenagers also. And I'll come back to this because this is relevant from um, how we target new forms of treatment. We need, we need to target treatments in relation to what we actually see in those brain scans. Why would it be important to do them otherwise? We have keys here. So structural findings are different from the functional ones because structural MRI is actually measuring volume and structure. So um, we see that the amygdala and hippocampus in most, not all, but most studies in teens are smaller than in healthy controls. And what has also been shown recently in, in research is that this correlates not only to depression but especially to early life adverse events like early trauma, neglect, um, unsecure attachment um, that plays out this way also is highly related to depression and anxiety in, in teens so we have a very interesting correlation here so some people say uh, these days uh, now when this research has, has surfaced that um, maybe depression is a disorder of disruptive development maybe it is that the structure can't really thrive and develop as they should because there are limbic scars. If there has been severe trauma with increased inflammatory response, with increased cortisol, increased oxidative stress early on, maybe there would be an interruption in the development and function of these structures and maybe that's linked to, to the depressive illness. And just to mention that trauma may see something that is doesn't happen to everyone, but it's so common. It's so common. And these are also scary numbers that I feel I need to show to you. Maybe you know it already, but one third of all children, if you look worldwide, have experienced physical abuse. And approximately one in four girls and one in five boys have been experiencing sexual violations. And in this country, in the United States, one million children experience, have experienced substantial uh, abuse. And this, this is severe abuse. But there are other kinds of abuse. Um, and one great problem with abuse is that it's transgenerational. So often a person who has been traumatized have difficulties in emotion regulation. So there will be more uh, trauma happening in the relationships around that person. So 
often um, the way trauma is transmitted from generation to generation is parents' um, difficulties in being there for and holding the kid's emotional experience, which is needed for the brain to develop and for the kid to be able to regulate. So um, you can say that self-regulation develops in the context of secure attachment. And this is something that we kind of have forgotten about within child psychiatry these days. It used to be more um, an interest in that and also treatment targeted to, to help relationships. Now we are more into uh, looking at the teenager as one person with a disorder and prescribing a drug instead of looking for the system around that kid and how we can help that whole system to contain what's going on. And what about this? Is this an ongoing trauma? Is it that kids actually don't practice social interaction much these days as compared to what they used to? That they are caught up in their, <laughs> their te technical items? We don't know, but it's worth considering and there should be more research looking into this. Social media is something that has been researched, especially uh, when it comes to internet bullying, cyber bullying, um, uh, social media uh, where um, children easily can feel excluded, uh, can be really harmful, especially if you're already depressed and vulnerable to social exclusion. Um, it can be dangerous. Have anybody seen this movie? Yeah. <laughs> Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an important piece of work, um, and it's questioning very much of our culture about the race to nowhere, the way school systems are built where you need to test and score well. Uh, it's not really about learning life skills that are adequate for most kids. Um, and they're overscheduled, they have hours and hours of homework, and they're just little kids. If you haven't seen this movie, I can highly recommend it. It's, it's something that I think it's also worth thinking about. So, um, just to recapitulate, rec recapitulate, recapitulate, just to repeat. <laughs> uh, we don't much believe that it's the problem of serotonin deficiency only. Uh, we don't think that treating negative cognitive bias will solve the problem either. We've seen that SSRIs and CBT is not doing that much as we wish they, they would. Instead, we should target what, what, what I think would be the future and what we're trying to do in our new treatment model is to target this limbic hyperreactivity and the stress response and the inflammatory response and to improve the limb, the, you remember the insular cortex, to improve that emotional self-awareness, to be able to read one's own bodily signals about what's going on and be able to voice that and interact with other people in an embodied way and in that way also to regulate emotion. These are skills that can be practiced, right? Uh, and also to address the, the rumination part. Uh, and there is some interesting research, I'll come back to that, uh, of how to do that. And something that I am increasingly interested in is to contextualize depressive disorder. I think there is something wrong about this medicalization way of understanding depression. I think it's something more. And I want to share that with you. That is more speculative, but I want to share it just like um, have you think about it. And I'm super interested to hear your feedback also. So again, this picture, the same one. <laughs> just, just to kind of hammer this in. Uh, we want to reduce uh, the, the automatic limbic hyperactivity and we want to increase capacity for emotion regulation. Now we're at the insula. Up there we are at amygdala and hippocampus. And we want to increase metacognition, and metacognition our capacity to realize that we are ruminating or our capacity to realize that we are full of anxiety or depressive thinking that goes on and on and on. And realize that we have a choice. We can keep on doing that, but we can also shift our attention to present moment awareness. And where do we find that? Any suggestion? Exem for example, our own breathing. That's all our sensory 
things are happening in this present moment. And if we tend, when we feel anxious, if we tend to how am I feeling in my right foot right now, or how am I feeling in how is my heart beating, how is my breath going, that is something that shifts the blood flow from the medial prefrontal cortex to the insular cortex, and it makes us present and aware and embodied. And that is a skill to practice for these teens, especially for the teens who have brain plasticity, who can rewire much easier than we can do. Uh, and then maybe when we have acquired these skills, we can also learn some more CBT top-down strategies because there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they are too hard to do <laughs> if you have all of this happening at the same time. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> so if we would continue thinking from here, how can we reduce inflammation in our body? Well. We know all about this already. We can try to sleep better, we, and we do that by de-stress during the day so that we can come back to a baseline before we go to sleep. We can eat a diet that contains no sugar, no high fructose syrup. That's the most toxic substance we can give our kids, and it increases systemic inflammation in a very scary way. Physical activity is key to decrease inflammation. And we can train those, you remember my pictures of the autonomic regulation, that vagus nerve. We want to increase the vagal afferents to the limbic brain. And we do that by breathing slowly, calmly. We can take a lot, we have a lot to learn from yoga, for instance, in this. And then we want to create hubs and communities for kids where they feel secured and accepted as they are, where they can be themselves and to try to minimize the impact of social media and social reject rejection mechanisms. And we have responsibilities as adults here. We also have something to learn from um, the third wave CBT. It's called an acceptance commitment therapy. Stephen Hayes, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a new type of therapy that has no evidence yet in adolescent depression. But I th still think there is some key things that can be valuable uh, to learn. And one is to kind of inform kids about that everybody is not, it's not normal to be happy all the time. <laughs> it's like, where, where do we, we get that assumption from? It's, I don't know if it's driven from, from consumerism or something that we're supposed to be happy and if we're not happy we should buy something to get happy or something like that. But <laughs> it's just, apparently it doesn't work. So um, instead, acceptance of emotions, like whatever I feel, why not accept it because I'm already feeling it anyway, and be with it, and make that be my life experience. And the, the third wave of CBT and the ACT have incorporated a lot of mindfulness techniques, um, how, how, to, how to actually practice those skills, um, and also, especially ACT talks a lot about um, experiential avoidance and how that is related to committed action. And I was wondering if you have ever been in this little roundabout. <laughs> I think most of us have. Uh, we want to do something, but it's kind of outside of our comfort zone. And instead of going over there where we would want to go, we kind of loop around in this detour. And a lot of data now shows that this experiential avoidance detour is very much linked to psychopathology and especially anxiety and depression. Because the more we, we tend to avoid, the smaller our world becomes and the more scared we get to step out of there. So by actually um, finding things that we value so much so that we're prepared to do them even though we're scared, that's key. And knowing then that the happiness is a trap. It's not about being happy all the time. It's about living your life according to your deepest values that matters. That's for many people who do ACT therapy, uh, like the hugest insight that's linked to um, a greater well-being in the end. It may seem paradoxical, but highly relevant for kids. And, th and they, they relate to this, especially in social, in social context. They want to be friends with one person who say they walk away this way. <laughs> and, and that doesn't help. So,
knowing all of this that we now know, I want to put out some more speculative questions to you. And I want to ask, talk about experimental avoidance, could it be that anxiety and depression are our young people's way to respond to a collective experiential avoidance that is connected to a world that we're in that is in a crisis? We're about to extinct ourselves on this planet. And we're living over an environment and a planet to our kids that is not sustainable. And we're not really grieving that together with them. We're not really clear about this. But they are having these messages into their universe every day. They are being told about animals getting extinct, about carbon dioxide emissions and threats from all kinds of places. And is it that we are in our experiential avoidance loop here, that we're not dealing with this with our younger kids? I'm just asking. Maybe it's adequate reactions to our value system. It's our way of value things that drives us into those loops that is not very good for the natural world and our sustainability as the human species on this planet, right? So is it that our values some way are toxic for the younger generation to grow up with? Maybe depression is symptoms of a race to nowhere. Maybe our kids in the deepest of their hearts know that this race is not what life is about, really. There are other things. They get disconnected from relationships and they get disconnected from the natural world. They get very much into their headspace and they're running a race that is built up by a culture and a context that maybe doesn't resonate with them, but they can't do much about it. It's very disempowering. Is this something that we can talk with them about? Or are we leaving them with all these questions? I was touching on this before. Maybe the way we uh, diagnose these kids is actually disempowering. Maybe we should say that, you know, your reaction is, is kind of adequate. Let's, let's see how we can empower you. And maybe we're contributing to the problems with this mass prescription of psychotropic drugs. Maybe it's not the way to go. I'm interested to debate with you or talk about this after. Um, there is a concept also about functional depression. Like from a more evolutionary perspective, what if we're running and running and running one direction? We're trying so hard and we're not getting where we want. Could it be that it's functional sometimes to actually lay down on the ground and grieve that I was, it wasn't possible to run this way. I need to reorientate. I need to kind of go into my own space and find new ways that are more sustainable. Could it be that a whole generation of young kids are in this space right now? They are reassessing our, our, our predicament. And I am going to take five minutes of your time. I hope that's okay to remind us, I know that you already know this, but I still wanted to share this video with you because I think it's a very concise and precise way to formulate where we're at as human beings right now. According to the United Nations, sustainability is the ability of the current generation to meet its needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. In many ways, the mass consumption dream of the modern world has been a nightmare for the global environment. No civilization has ever survived the ongoing destruction of its natural support systems, nor will ours. In fact, the world is rapidly approaching a number of tipping points, thresholds beyond which dangerous trends will become irreversible, threatening the existence of life as we know it. Humanity has been continuously increasing its resource demand, 
to the extent that by the 70s we started to use more than what nature can regenerate. Currently, we are using at least 50% more than what nature can renew. So we are in global overshoot. Overshoot can be thought of as living off of your credit card. You know, humanity is living off its ecological credit card. If we use more than nature can keep up with, we actually start to erode natural capital that life depends on. Currently, if everyone on Earth lived as North Americans do, we'd need four Earths. For everyone to live as Europeans do would take two and a half Earths. In other regions, people are living beyond the capacity of one Earth as well. China and India are presently living just around the one Earth level. But given the rapid industrialization and economic growth of both countries, that's sure to change. In a series of comprehensive reports, the largest group of scientists ever assembled on a single issue has warned that unless we act now, it is extremely likely that climate change will have devastating impacts on the future of life on Earth. Scientists around the world have come together to tell us that climate change is actually happening at a much faster rate than they had first anticipated. The signs of this are the cataclysmic storms, the extremes in weather, the polar ice caps are melting, and it means that the entire ecosystem is in peril. 192 nations are in agreement that to avoid irreversible climate change, the global temperature must not rise more than 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet if we continue to burn fossil fuels at the current rate, we will surpass 2 degrees Celsius by mid-century. To change this trajectory and stabilize the global climate, it will take immediate, unprecedented cooperation and action by governments, businesses and individuals. We simply have to stop. We have to conserve. We have to change our lifestyles. We have to face the climate crisis that is upon us. While people are becoming increasingly aware of the effects of climate change, what's not as well known is the impact we're having on other species. We are in the midst of a mass extinction, but the news has not reached the general public. They are utterly unaware that the sacred and talismanic and heartbreakingly loved companions of ours on this earth are about to disappear forever. They will not return. African lions are on the absolute verge of extinction. There are only 20,000 left. That's down 90% in the past few decades. Every species and subspecies of tiger on the planet is on the absolute verge of extinction. Elephants down 90% in the past century. 90% of all large fish are gone from the oceans. Half of all species of life may be extinct in 50 years. Nothing this destructive has happened in 65 million years. I mean, why is that not our, our central concern? It is, it's overwhelming. No one imagined it could happen. So suddenly, we're confronted with this fact and we don't really know how to respond to it. I think that's beyond most of us because we haven't deepened our hearts uh, in a way that would, would be, make possible the, the grief that is wanting to be felt.
Take a few deep breaths. It's, uh, yeah. I think we definitely need to look at the context we're in, where we're talking about de depression and anxiety in our younger generations. And we need to, uh, we all have a responsibility to talk with them about this. And we could kind of reverse the whole process of addressing these so-called mental disorders in young people. Instead of starting where I started this lecture, we could start in asking us what skill set we need to be able to have as young people in this world to make our human species sustainable on the planet. And not only sustainable, but actually also I would say a just word and a spiritually fulfilling uh, presence, uh, life worth living. And maybe this same skill set can be effective to increase the individual resilience for anxiety and depression. Maybe the same skill set is simply a healthy human brain development. And if that's the case, how can we he help facilitate our young people's brain to grow as healthy and strong as possible? Especially when the plasticity is at its peak, which is one, one of those periods is in the teenage years. This is a super important time of brain development. Um, I saw this... Um, Notice in the paper the other day where it seems they've actually sued the government for failing to address climate change for future generations. So there are young people also taking action. Everybody isn't depressed or in experiential avoidance. There are actually things happening out there also, a lot of things. And um, resilience, I think, is sustainability is, is one thing that we can talk about from an environmental perspective. I think we need to talk about sustainability from a mental health perspective also. Another concept that I think is really useful is resilience. And resilience is the capacity of a system, and it can be any system, an individual, a family, a forest, uh, to deal with change and still continue to develop, to adapt in functional ways. And <coughs> the capacity then is to... Uh, be creative in terms of um, shock or severe disturbances like climate change or, or maybe on the individual uh, um, universe uh, as a depression. Uh, and resilience also embraces um, new learning, uh, diversity and also the belief that human is part of the greater ecosystem and the natural world. Like, like there is so much research pointing to an interconnectedness among things in the biosphere. We are not an isolated person. We are interlinked with other people and with the food we eat and the air we breathe and the water we drink. It's like one, one whole system. And if one part of the system is unhealthy, of course, I'll have symptoms, especially if I'm a sensitive person. And I think this is also something that we need to think about. Who is getting depressed? It's not the most robust individuals who have all this energy to just plow forward. It's our most sensitive population. They are picking up on this. They are feeling things. And being a sensitive person in our culture is often looked upon as something that is um, a risk factor or a weakness. But I think sensibility is something that we should value. And we really should listen to the kids with anxiety and depression because they are voicing something that we all need to look at. Maybe we can also learn something from the wisdom traditions. What would they say about our current way of treating kids? Maybe they would say that our medical pharmaceutical solutions are ecologically illiterate and too single problem oriented. Or maybe they would say that uh, the mental health in generations to come is linked to the natural world somehow. So maybe this is a role, we are now in, at the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine and I, I have this feeling that integrative medicine has a very pivotal place to play when it comes to new integrative ways of treating and contextualizing mental health problems. So 
So um, I'm very happy to, to have the support of the OSHA Center to do this work here. Um, yeah, I don't think, I think I've talked about all this already. Um, so I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes now to talk about the actual intervention. With all of this considered, what are we going to do? And how are we going to create something that, that can address these problems in new creative ways? Um, and when we started thinking about this, we started from the hardcore neuroscience. We looked to the brain, we looked to the amygdala, we looked to the insula, we looked to the medial prefrontal cortex, and we were asking ourselves, what can we do to make the brain develop as good as possible? And especially, we wanted to prioritize the key areas that we were thinking were driving the pathophysiology most. And then we organized these kind of constructs hierarchically, so we were creating... Um, an intervention with different modules that we were starting off with the most priorities one and then building on from there. So it's kind of a skills training. Um, and this is a good way, I think, to approach it because if I, start, if I would have started this talk with you to talk about yoga or mindfulness or meditation, that would be, oh, <laughs> some people don't want to hear about that. But if we can actually look at it in a more neutral way and see, you know, what, what are we doing by breathing technique? We're actually increasing vagal afferents and we're actually addressing the amygdala hyperreactivity. It's a very cool way. We have our breath with us every day. Is this something that we could use in treating depression? Then I don't need to be um, biased in any way when it comes to culture or when it comes to spirituality or contemplation methods at all. Um, and then... With all of this, we created this um, program, which is now a 12 weeks group program. So we have currently one group running with uh, 11 kids and mixed boys and girls, and they meet for one and a half hours, 12 weeks. And of course, we want to test this. We want to do research. We want to prove our point. So the idea is to do brain scans before and after the intervention and assess the key areas that I've been talking about to see if we can actually re rewire their brain and then also assess their well-being and their proactivity and, you know, how, what, where they are at. For those of you who are more um, scientifically interested, uh, we published this article and this is together with uh, Larissa Duncan and uh, Professor H, who is at the OSHA Center. Margaret Chesney also is there. And uh, Tony and Kaya and Tiffany and Com they are at the UCSF at this neuroscience lab that are um, doing research, neuro neuroscience research on adolescent depression. So this, uh, you can find this on, on the internet. Now we created uh, a matrix that looks like this, and I'll go through it a little bit more in detail. Every session, those 12 sessions, is organized in the same way, so it's a little ritual. We sit in a circle, we open the circle, we check in with everyone, how are you doing today, what how has your week been? We try to create this, this um, safe space where they can be who they are. They are not tested. They are not uh, mm, judged in any way. So it's really important that we have teachers who can encompass and show them the way about this type of behavior. Um, and then they have homework. They have skills training. They get audio recordings to practice uh, breathing techniques, simple yoga postures, and things like that. And we'll go through that. Then we have a little bit of theory. We talk about all these practices that they can do to decrease their inflammatory processes. We talk about what food they should eat, what they can do about their sleep, about their physical exercise. We're giving them education. Um, and then the rest half of the session is skills training. So we do uh, breathing training and we do uh, yoga-based movements, so it's uh, very slow, gentle movements that are synchronized with the breath that increases the body awareness, the interceptive awareness, and it's also an attentional focus, attentional training. Uh, and then they, they meditate, and most of the meditations are like body scans. They are laying down and they are with their attention uh, go to different areas of the body to feeling what there is to feel. And towards the end, we are having also more, more sitting 
sitting meditation. And then we close the circle in the same safe space. So it's based on the four modules with, which are equivalent to the brain areas that I've been talking about. And the first one is to use our root system. We, used to want, we want to use the bottom-up approach instead of that CBT top-down control. We're using regulatory skills bottom-up. And how do we do that? One way to do it is to use our diaphragm while we're breathing. So they, try, they train paced, slow, kind of yogic breathing through their nostrils. Uh, and by doing this, uh, we know that we stimulate the vagal nerve to increase the vagal afferents. Signals go up from the diaphragm to the brain, telling the brain that everything is calm, you're fine. By doing this, they create a safe, calm inner space that they can self-regulate within. And we also borrowed techniques from yoga. Uh, as I said, simple yoga-inspired movements uh, that are also increasing vagal afferents the same way. So this is a skills training. And I think this is a good way to start. Uh, we have, I, I wanted to tell you also that we have, in the groups we've had so far, we have, had, we have not enough data yet to show efficacy uh, on the interventions. It's still a very early phase where we have developed the manual and we're trying this out. But what we can say is that we have very good retention. The kids who sign up, they come. And it seems like it's adequate for them. They, they seem to relate well to what we're doing there. So module number two, it's um, this more interceptive awareness, insular cortex, body scans, sitting, naming interior body sensations as feelings. Some, some kids have very limited vocabulary for feelings. They have difficulty voicing their feelings. They have difficulties in communicating and reading other people's emotions. So we practice this. But especially this second module is about not so much in relation, that comes later. Here it's more about actually being in one's own body. And then in module three, we have more about emotion regulation in relation. So this is about knowing your emotional triggers. What, what, what kind of people triggers me? And what can, I, can I breathe myself through that? What can I do? Uh, and they practice this in little exercises we do within social interaction in small groups within the bigger group, and <coughs> they use those vagal afferents techniques to, to kind of self-regulate through that emotional interaction. And we, stop to, we, we start here also to introduce a little bit of bottom-down so that they can also start to use talking to themselves and, and self-assess and things like that. Um, self-compassion is a big part, self-acceptance, um, which is a strategy to actually cope with social rejection if that would ever happen, how, to knowing how you react, what, what your nervous system, what happens. And then in the last module, come, we come back to the core values again, uh, goal setting and committed action. Uh, so in depression treatment, you talk often about behavioral activation. If you have this teenager who stays in bed, you, you want to do something to activate that person. And from uh, acceptance commitment therapy and Stephen Hayes' work, we know that value-based committed action is very powerful. Because if you can help someone to really identify with core, deep down in the heart values and have that as, as, a, as a motivational force for behavioral activation, that works really well. And in that, in that context, you also challenge your experiential avoidance patterns. You, you step out of your comfort zone. And by naming and talking about it like this, it, it, it seems to be empowering for young people to have it named and framed this way. Um, and we also want to bring in the discussion about environment, about their future, about the relationship to us as the generation who is leaving a planet in this condition to them and how they can contribute and how everybody is totally necessary to make this huge turning that we need to do to be sustainable on the planet. Because this is something 
I mean, young people are very different, and not all of them have this in clear awareness, but they are affected in one way or the other. And by naming this elephant in the room, it's also something that, ha, huh, <laughs> it happens something, and it activates them. Uh, so this is an important part of the program towards the end, that we're still kind of working to find the good ways to, to communicate with them. And ideally, I would love to create like a um, buffer sessions that they could come into for yoga classes or for the community, for the safe place, uh, to create hubs globally where people can relate this way with one another. Um, we'll see how it goes. We, we need your support <laughs> to, to do that. Uh, and then we're super clear about everything that we do. We never tell them anything unless giving them the rationale from neuroscience or from vagal afferents or from biology or from other types of research. We are super, super clear why we're doing things. We're not giving them anything uh, without that. And why we do that is because we want to demystify things and we want to create, create hope and trust. We want them to know that you can rewire, you can do these things, and, and if you do them, it's, it's going to shift something within you. Um, and we found that this increased uh, compliance and retention in the program also. They, 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 they trust us if we're clear about what we're doing. This is no... Uh, um, yeah. And also we want to provide a, a foundation for inquiry and for curiosity and for dialogue uh, about how they can maintain their own health and sanity and wellness, and also how they can cultivate and care for their family. Often that's a big problem for teenagers and their more extended community. And also how they can find a way to contribute for our future. So currently we have done one pilot phase to kind of test out this manual. Uh, in a group of depressed teenagers uh, and we're currently in we have done one another bigger group with a mixture of kids with both anxiety and depression and we're now in the midst of recruiting for a third group um, starting somewhere beginning mid -mar uh, April <laughs> April uh, already in March and we are also testing out this uh, scanning protocol so that we'll be able to do the brain scans and hopefully prove our point with more hardcore neuroscience as well. Uh, and also um, to collect preliminary data to, to prove some efficacy in this group so that we can uh, apply for bigger grants to be able to do this full scale. The goal is to do a so-called randomized controlled trial where we recruit teens and then we randomize them to an active condition with TARA in addition to treatment as usual and then we have only treatment as usual. And then we compare pre and post um, to be able to show that, that this is an effective treatment. And that's, that's um, a huge undertaking that will take time and resources to do but we hope we'll be able to uh, pursue that path. And then we want to follow, follow up, of course, to see that we maintain possible results. Um, three months, ideally, in a randomized controlled trial this time, we want to do it for extended periods of time also. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to go through this in detail. We have um, most of the study visits. Um, we need to have the teenagers' consent and the parents' consent to be able to do research like this and uh, we do a lot of pre and post assessments, self-assessment and things like that. All of that is taking place at the OSHA Center right across the street from here and Patty is our uh, project leader, project responsible person. Uh, so if you have any questions you can talk to one of us afterwards. Um, and we include basically all kids that have anxiety and depressive problems uh, unless they have some comorbidity or other problems that make it really hard for them to be in a group setting. Um, but we are aware of this situation that there is so much comorbidity so we don't find it realistic to exclude and just have one of these DSM disorders that is not very relevant anyway. <laughs> and um, yes. Yeah. 
we have also, in the midst of trying this for healthy teens, I mean healthy, I mean teens with a lot of stress in their lives, but who do not yet have a psychiatric disorder, and uh, we are more looking into improved wellness and improved attention, things like that, and we want their feedback, especially on how they perceive the module, so we can do is as relevant as possible for them. So this is ongoing at uh, UCSF Parnassus at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> and we have um, five minutes for, for questions, if there is, yes? Usual care is most often antidepressant medication, SSRIs typically, sometimes uh, antipsychotic drugs as well, or CBT, and or CBT. But I would say most often the kids are only on medication with no psychological treatment. Yes? What did you say now? I can't hear you. You mean ADHD medication? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the amphetamine derivatives, they work on the dopamine system and not on the serotonergic um, system. So there have been some interesting research. There is uh, Wilma Gabay in, at Columbia University who has been doing um, specifically studies looking at people with depression who also have, have anhedonia, like very low motivation. And the idea is that those people have uh, a dysfunctional dopamine circuit, and especially in that population of depression, um, maybe stimulants could have an effect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, so your question is rather whether the um, central stimulantia would increase depression or prevent it if it has, if it's related. I, I don't think so. I, not that I'm aware of, but I, I, I'll follow up on that. Yeah, it's, it's a relevant question. But the idea about treating um, anhedonia with dopamine-stimulating drugs is, is, has been done in adults. I don't know if it has been in teens. There is no Ritalin or anything like that being prescribed on the indication of depression at the moment, but... Yeah, yeah, I look into it. <laughs> yes? So the question, if I heard you right, was um, if it's the same type of antidepressant medication, the ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are also used for anxiety disorders, and yes. For mild to moderate depression in teenagers, placebo is as effective as placebo. For more severe depression, it's a bit different. if they are more effective in treating anxiety? Yes. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't have that. I'm, uh, that's something I would need to look into also. Yeah. But they are used for all kinds of conditions. The same substances are used for premenstrual problems. It's used for um, uh, impulse control related problems. So it's the certain receptors are, are diversely spread out in the brain. Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure for all types of different anxiety disorders that you can have. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you that. I don't know. Yeah. Yes? Yes? Yes?
Oh, I see what you mean.